Okay, I think we are live. Um, let's see the mic input there. Okay, this is part two of the stream I started the other day, which was a reaction to reactions to uh, the local election results and all of the um, umming and ahhing and uh, uh, hair pulling about the proposed deal that Theresa May now wants to do with Jeremy Corbyn and um, effectively what I've been doing since then is kind of trying to look behind the narrative behind the narrative um, and so this is a theme that doesn't just go back to the 2015 election general election in the UK or merely the 2016 uh, Brexit election uh, it goes back considerably further than that um, even if one goes back to the Second World War, the end of the Second World War and the formation of the European Economic and Steel Community um, prior to that even if you go back you'll find articles by H.G. Wells about a chap called Mr. Streit who proposed a, an EU um, you find proposals for a unified Europe in um, Hitler's writing. But then again, even if you go back before that, uh, to the First World War, the Treaty of Versailles, you go back before that, you go to the turmoil of 1848 and the revolutions across Europe then. Um, you go back even further than that to the 18... Um, well, it's Na the Napoleonic Wars and then the post-Napoleonic War uh, settlements and it's there really where modern real politics starts in the sense of the writing um, of Henry Kissinger. So, um, what I wanted to do was I've got a whole bunch of windows open on my computer which are beginning to clog things up a bit and what I'm going to do on the screen here I'm just going to come from left to right uh, and um, basically say something about each window save the link um, and this is really just the notes for whatever it is I'm going to write next and I'm not quite sure what that's going to be. Um, I have been wondering whether there's uh, a poem in this or whether it actually um, should sort of actually get me into finishing off Conquest of Doe um, and plugging some of these angles on this many faceted thing we call life um, and, 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 and uh, finish off the, the novel. Um, aligned with that, the publishing portal um, and the Web3 um, side of uh, the working title of Objective Kuntz, Objective Kuntz, um, the paradigm shift, Thomas Kuhn and all that. Um, and uh, again, um, part of what I've been working on these past few days is, is getting my integrated development environments kind of up to speed on my machine. Um, obviously having all these windows open isn't, isn't really helping me with that either. Uh, so that's a longish introduction, but anyway, let's just kick off um, with the first window. Let me just get my, uh, I have a document here from the video which I did, which is, this is part two of, the beginning of wisdom. And you can see it's not actually dragging across my uh, computer, it's not enjoying this at all. So anyway, here's this document. Come back, please. There we are. Um, 
got a few links in there but what this is is the transcript and this is what I'm after from doing this video is I'm going to uh, try and keep my sentences short and clear um, and uh, work through these windows so that I've got a record of the windows I had open because there's some interesting stuff here and some sites I've not visited before so that's this document here which I'm now going to just get on my other screen here scroll down to the bottom of the document and start adding the links as we go and they should more or less correspond with the paragraphs and timings as I go as well so anyway what is the first window that I've got here open there are a series of YouTube videos open um, and here's this first one here and this was the Channel 4 series of uh, films um, a journalist I think she's called Carol or Caroline Cadwallada in the Observer broke the Cambridge Analytica story about election meddling um, by Russians by the Mercers by Bannon by the alt-right uh, but this Cambridge Analytica thing uh, cropped up and this video Channel 4 moves from the 19th of March um, highlights a kind of a sting operation on um, the then chief executive a chap by the name of Nix you can see him up here uh, Alexander Nix um, and uh, It's talking about psycho um, graphics and the use of social media to form um, profiles of voters or consumers uh, and then using these uh, predisposed biases to message um, those people. Now anyone that knows anything about Google Analytics and anyone who um, has been involved in internet marketing or knows how Facebook ads, Google ads, how Siri, the, uh, voice recognition algorithms work, uh, shouldn't have been surprised by any of this stuff. What is more surprising is that one aggrieved party um, it should try to expose another for using these techniques which have been well known um, since the 1930s and people like um, uh, Edward Bernays and Walter Lippmann, Torches of Freedom, if that doesn't mean anything to any of you, look it up, Google Torches of free, uh, Freedom, Edward Bernays. If you've watched Manufacturing Consent or read Manufacturing Can uh, Consent, which is um, uh, a book by Noam Chomsky and... Um, I always struggle to remember the other guy's name that wrote it with him. Is it Herman or something? Um, and uh, anyway, it's a good film worth watching. But this Analytica stuff really just brings up to date those techniques. But instead of using Rolodexes um, and punch card computers and what have you, we're using modern digital technology. Um, and modern network computing and what this actually does is it means that there is more more and quicker communication uh, which can be more personalized um, and therefore uh, it's less of a sledgehammer to crack a nut I mean basically you build a nutcracker for each individual consumer voter etc um, and with uh, iterative processes and um, 
machine learning and what we call artificial intelligence, the possibilities of this stuff are, um, well, to say they're mind-boggling is to understate um, quite what the possibilities are. Um, but the problem with these possibilities is like, along with very large numbers, um, just the vastness and the amount of information that is potentially available uh, is, is more than we can cope with. Um, we, we all have different levels of information, uh, but we do, we filter, we make priorities in terms of what we see at any one time. Our senses work like that, otherwise you get sensory overload. Um, and uh, so filtering and um, anticipating and interpreting what is coming before us it is part of the process of of thinking um, and it's something that we do subconsciously um, and therefore um, with this sort of open door that, that we are offering by say going online uh, or even opening your eyes in the modern world um, there, there's a lot there's a lot going on and um, uh, you know people shouting for attention and all the rest of it um, and Cambridge Analytica is really just a small aspect of this much larger question about um, uh, the manipulation of... I mean, that the analogue to this was there was a lot of stuff about subliminal ad advertising which was banned in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, and subliminal advertising was flashing very quick images which weren't visible to the human to, 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 to our conscious mind but which registered subconsciously and therefore um, you know an advert about something would be playing and it would play images that stimulated other thoughts that would then marry up and sort of think oh I must go and get one of those. Uh, subliminal advertising was a thing and I can test is still a thing, um, except it, it's gone on several degrees of sophistication. Um, and so Cambridge Analytica, I, I, I decided to watch these Channel 4 films and see what they were saying, um, and to think of them in terms of not so much of what they were saying, or, you know, that, that was new, as to say what boundaries were Being, um, guided to think about these matters. So, if one looks at the stuff, it's aimed at delegitimizing Trump, of delegitimizing the vote for Brexit, uh, and um, then closing off those thought patterns. I think, well, if they can do it surely the other people can do it too um, and the answer to that is yes of course they 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 have and they did um, in the 2017 about uh, conservative party call centers who were uh, reading scripted uh, things to uh, voters and misleading voters. Now you don't hear anything about that anymore at this stage of the, you know, the Brexit fudge, if you like. Um, so that really is, is what I I was um, forming the view of um, when I watched these again. Now I'm just gonna, as I go, I'm not gonna play specific bits of that, but what I might do is actually do a, a big um,
you know, get all the transcripts together and do a big um, work about it. I said, I'm going to do that as I go because um, if there is a transcript on this, I think there is. I'll just click this. Come on. I might actually have to because I've got so much. Uh, right, so let's just close that window. Cambridge Analytica. Close and have I frozen? What's happened here? No, we're still, we still seem to be going. Right, okay, so I'm going to leave that one open because that's my streaming window. And then let's just get this next window open here. It's going to take a little time for me to write. So here's the reaction to the former um, CEO being grilled by MPs. So I'm just going to... Because this was a story that went on for quite a while, if you remember. Um, the first I heard of um, Cambridge Analytica was actually Sam Williamson's channel. I love his channel. Um, and, and, and he uh, was... was uh, mentioning Cambridge Analytica in one of his early Brexit is an inside job videos which again I'm going to revisit uh, so and I'm just going to make a note here um, at the start of all this get video transcripts for wordplay I want to do some textual analysis on this just to get the keywords out of um, Cambridge Analytica uh, stories. Uh, so, so that was that one there. Alexander Nick said he was tricked into boasting to an undercover reporter working for this programme that this political strategy firm used honey traps and bribery to smear political opponents. An interesting part of that is the Steele dossier and um, the Russiagate thing in, um, and the Steele dossier and its links to the Skripal affair and the um, mysterious Pablo Miller and the D-notices surrounding that episode which kind of came after Cambridge Analytica but this Alexander Nix and the... the, the um, boasting that he said to have you know that he claims to have been doing uh, is quite an interesting thing that occurred to me when I was listening to his um, his explanations of, of what he had or had not been doing but we'll come to another interesting part of that in, in one of the other videos coming up um, grew by MP so let's close one. Right now, then, this is a year. Uh, this is July 2017, okay, and this is a film by Gabriel Gatehouse. Um, it should be Gabriel Gatekeeper. Gabriel Gatehouse. Um, I've done another blog about Gabriel Gatehouse, and a lot of his. Um, videos about Russian meddling um, and he does a lot of the stories that kind of surround the propaganda narratives um, and the Russian meddling ones are really quite interesting he's an interesting character he speaks Russian um, and I think several other languages um, he did another uh, film about the referendum or the referendas that they have in, in, in Switzerland talking about William Tell um, um, I will find that blog and I'll, I, I will put that in the um, thing but he interviews um, the uh, chief executive of Cambridge Analytica a year before all this these exposures coming out and that's quite an interesting, uh, quite an interesting thing. Um, 
I mean, he asked the guy, you know, what are you, a con man? You sort of say, you're saying these things one way and then the other. And, you know, um, there's another interesting clip of an American politician that actually says, oh, well, yeah, they said they're going to help us with the Ted Cruz campaign, made all these great promises, but frankly, it was all bullshit. Is that, I'm not sure if that is... Uh, a psychologist I, I do question the motives of them um, this this infographic here is quite interesting um, but I, the links will be in the description and um, with their titles and you can watch them in your own time um, I mean obviously I I've formed my own kind of angle, whatever point it is that pops out at the end of this video, and uh, SoundCloud, um, AF4SLM, I can say that, that there. As I say, I'm really not sure where this is going, but I wanted to just get these notes, um, print off the transcript, then when the video um, processes. Come on, please. Uh, and then I can free up my processing power. Right, so that's that video there, the Newsnight one, which was about a year before. Let's just uh, do this. I'm going to put that date in there, because that's important. Because that story, if you think about it, it did run for a long time. Um, okay. Then what have we got next? Well, I've got something else downloading in another browser at the moment. So, uh, right, okay, what's that? Fury analysis and guitar jamming. That came up in my feed and I've left it here. Um, and Fourier analysis is really very interesting because what it does is it basically is a predictive forecasting thing based on waveforms and lookup tables. And um, uh, it forms the basis of a lot of climate modeling, but a lot of other modeling as well. Um, and this is a good video, which I watched some time ago. It's from 2009. It's had quite a few views. Um, but the mathematics of modeling and predictive algorithms is based on um, analogues in nature. And so you have different phenomena, like say the gas laws or um, various aspects of um, chaos uh, theory. Um, and what these these waveforms or these uh, geometric or trigonometry sort of shapes um, are then mapped onto other data sets and then the data sets are then set to run according to whatever the um, waveform of a particular phenomena which it is fancied kind of lines up with what seems to be happening and this then comes to sort of fitting of graphs fitting of uh, shapes and forms um, and we're going to come up in a minute to van neumann's elephant uh, and so this video here um, is kind of a bit out of sequence i'm just going to put it in here but it's relevant to van neumann's 
elephant, um, which at this stage may or may not mean something to you, um, but it will do in just a little while. Uh, fully analysis and guitar jamming, 60 symbols. Now it's quite interesting to, you know, I, I had a look at that one and was sort of pining for my uh, sound modelling days, which is, uh, put it this way, it's much more fun than modelling public opinion. Um, so, there we are, that's that for analysis uh, new one that's the one there okay and then what do we have in the next window all right the next window here okay that's my youtube channel and uh, suggested things to watch so what have we got i haven't watched that yet Ap apocalypse now real versus fake that's Windows on the World. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, and uh, here we are. Uh, Tommy Robinson attacked on campaign trail. Um, I would have thought Mirror on Peds. Oh, this is Anthony Joshua. Uh, he's got a big boxing match for the world coming up. So, anyway. That's... Um, which I'm going to leave open this is my inbox right and this is married to my wife's cousin Linnea who's a mate of mine who lives up in Stockholm um, who sent me this ad now I'm just going to just run through the what it is is the Web3 Foundation which started by was started Wood and Gavin Wood wrote the Ethereum Yellow Paper and is a co-founder of Ethereum which is something I've been working on since 2015, 2000, yeah 2015, uh, 2016 you know, um, but my latest work is on Web3 um, and uh, Gavin has another project called Polkadot and Web3 seems to be about that. I've been working on IPFS which is um, a guy called um, uh, what's it called? Juan Bennett. Juan Bennett who's a uh, I don't know if he's a doctor yet. I don't know whether he's doing a doctor at Stanford but IPFS is a super network of computers Polkadot is proposing another thing and it, it's kind of the glue that joins them all together and allows different distributed networks to talk to each other. It's incredibly fascinating. Um, but there are a number of posts which they're recruiting for. My own background isn't in computer programming. Um, my own background is actually in valuation and surveying. Um, and the basis of surveying is trigonometry which is why surveyors crop up of, across history like for instance um, not many people know this Machiavelli was a surveyor um, and he and Leonardo da Vinci knew each other because Leonardo da Vinci used to do a bit of surveying as well for various of the warring princelings around uh, Italy um, but um, the the point about um, my discipline, which is valuation, um, is that valuation uses you know, um, computer modelling uh, for what, something called sensitivity analysis, risk analysis, and what have you in portfolio valuations. And um, I mean, I, I started using something called Monte Carlo analysis back in the mid 80s before Excel existed. I used to use something called Lotus 1, 2, 3. Uh, and in those days, we didn't even have computer terminals on our desk. And I, I worked for a big oil company, Shell UK. Um, and to do my uh, valuation modeling work, 
uh, at Shell, I actually used to go and, um, well, I did it with the computer scientists that worked in the data centre at, at Shell. Um, so I've had an interest in personal computers, um, not since the 70s when you used to be able to build your own. I wasn't a member of the computer club at school. Um, I, we did study basic programming um, in maths. Uh, I don't know if anyone else remembers that it was a sort of a half A3 size um, textbook. It was just called Basic with green writing on the front. It's quite a short book. And, and, um, I can remember we were doing that with teachers. We were learning basic with, with our actual computers in maths. I mean, go figure. Uh, but the, the point about um, all of that is that when the internet sort of came on the scene, um, so if you look at the early 80s, mid 80s, through into the 1990s, the BBC computing programs, um, and then when the internet came along, this is after, after Windows really, um, Before the mid nineties, not many people even knew it existed. Um, and um, we're at that point with Web three is really the point I'm making here. Um, and what the Web three Foundation say it's doing is it's trying to get people to adopt it more quickly for society to benefit, etc. Um, and Andesh sent me this because I, um, I've been looking for something to do. As an entrepreneur, I, uh, I think what I need to do is start a business, which I've been scratching my head about for a while. And like, well, what's a sensible thing to start a business in at this stage of what I think is is state monopoly capitalism, whereby any competition has been pretty much crowded out of the market as, as being um, well b b basically marginalized that, that that's how I see it anyway um, and so figuring out things like a, a web3 foundation you know um, what's what's their motivation where's this headed uh, looking at some of the narratives that are highly suspicious of um, the internet of things um, and certainly, 5G, for instance, um, where some of the motivations of the more corporate aspects of distributed computing and institution aspects of distributed computing. I mean, Graham Bannett works at Stanford. Gavin Wood um, obviously did Ethereum. Um, but if you look at the discussions that he and Vitalik Buterin, who also was a co-founder of, of uh, Ethereum, um, have going along, um, one wonders how their sympathies lie in terms of what I call the non-governmental organisation complex or sock puppet complex. Um, how in the wild are they? How truly distributed and democratic are these systems? Um, and so at the back of my mind, uh, I like open source computing and free computing, uh, but I look to Richard Stallman as my, you know, I mean, he's closer in age to me than, say, Gavin Wood. Um, and uh, I share in common with Richard Stallman a lot of his philosophy um, and um, I'm not sure, in fact the jury's out for me on how much of Gavin Wood's philosophy I share um, and it does become significant in distributed computing when there are models of uh, hierarchy, leadership and top-down control. And so when you look at consensus algorithms and you look at the consensus within these networks, uh, 
how democratic are they? There is a thing called machine voting. I mean, Gavin's designed a proportional representation system that you'll find on his personal website, which is fascinating stuff. Um, but what is the what's the underlying philosophy? You know, is there free will in Gavin's world, or is it a deterministic? Um, world which he envisions um, and um, yeah, all points in between really um, and so thanks for this Andish and I'm still kind of thinking about it all these jobs are in a place called Zug in Switzerland um, and uh, um, I don't really want to move to Switzerland um, I miss the UK a great deal um, and uh, but I also I like being left alone in my study in, 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 in rural Sweden doing my own thing and would quite happily work online um, in fact I do quite happily work online uh, and uh, whether that it would loosely work as part of this sort of operation indeed whether or not they'd be interested in me working for them as I say I'm not um, formally trained and most of these jobs I noticed are looking for a lot of postgraduate de degrees in various disciplines and um, which suggests to me that they want people that think the right way about things rather than think about things um, outside of the box and as an outside of the box thinker myself I, I um, I don't take kindly to being put in a box, that's true, but, but, but the other thing is that um, as the paradigm moves towards the new paradigm, um, people are setting boundaries for the next paradigm, um, which will be a carryover from the current one. And my suspicion about a lot of these foundations is that the um, you know the gatekeepers are already in place, um, and the pr early promise of say um, Bitcoin, which I would say the early false promise, and the early promise of Ethereum, which I don't think was a false promise. Uh, but let's remember where these places are, or where these things are actually springing from. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I am skeptical, I have to say, I am, I am skeptical, not about the technology and not about the good it can do, but in which way it is being directed um, and who is doing that directing. Uh, that's well, kind of all I'd say at this point. I'm, I'm still considering maybe sending a CV off to these people. Um, you know, as, as usual, they always say, you know, oh, if your job isn't advertised, you're sort of write and tell us about yourself. Um, so, anyway, we'll see. We'll see. But anyway, the Web3 Foundation is hiring, so if anyone else is watching and interesting, the link is going in. Uh, I'm just going to copy that now and put it across. But it is relevant to this whole idea of um, mass communication, instant communication, consensus and influencing the outcome of uh, supposedly free votes. Um, that's the, that is really the point. So let's just, this is on the Reddit page, we're just gonna uh, copy from here. Okay, so that's now saved, so I can close that window. Right, Polkadot. This is Polkadot, which is Gavin Wood's... Um, yeah, I've, I've been looking at this for a while now. Um, as I say, a fascinating fellow, Gavin Wood. These are all the people working on the Polkadot network. Uh, Aragon... 
that's something that I've been using. Um, the Energy Web Foundation, I haven't had a look at that. I will do. I'm just going to copy the link. Um, and just put that in there to have a look at later. Because I want to close these windows as I'm going, otherwise I'm... Pokedot, okay. And here we go. This is Gavin Wood's Twitter account. Um, and uh, there are a few things to look at on here. Um, now, this is interesting. Um, there's a UK Parliament petition where Gavin Wood is obviously I'm supporting revoking Article 50. Now, I have a, I mean, I don't agree with that. I, 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 I think that um, obviously that's related to the Cambridge Analytica questions. And there's another one coming up in a minute about that. Um, and uh, for all his brilliance, you know, I, you know and then here we have an exchange between Gavin and Vitalik, um, where they're discussing venture capital funded models um, and why or why they didn't go with that. And Vitalik said maybe Gavin said something on those matters, and he says no, he didn't. Uh, but anyway, that was. Uh, I'm going to retweet that just out of interest. Um, I mean, I know Vitalik has been courted by people like um, Bill Gates and what have you, and I'm sure Gavin is tainted and uh, courted. Um, and indeed, you know, I mean, they've given gongs to people who've done a lot less for, you know, cool stuff than, than Gavin. Um, so anyway, here's evidence that a cool guy can do really uncool stuff in my, you know, revoking Article 50. It just ain't cool, Gavin. It ain't cool. Um, so that's that. So um, let's go on to the next, next one here. Here we are. Right. Teams building at Polkadot, on, on Polkadot, a number of teams started researching or building Polkadot infrastructure. This is the Web3 Foundation. And here are a list of them. Um, and I had a look at their GitHub and what have you, so let's just uh, put that in here. Um, a joy stream this is what it's that's a distributed um, a few of these are open uh, video uh, thing it's quite an interesting um, looking at governance and how they do these things I mean back in the day there was a thing called the Republic of Doug on um, on YouTube um, and there is a, a depository of it on my github um, done by a Swedish programmer up in the north of Sweden here, which was a very early um, indication of what we could be done by smart contracts of the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Um, and for whatever reason, um, there was a Spanish uh, political theorist that seemed to have been involved, who was interested in community currency, did a lot of work on that. And uh, there is a community currency, there are several of them actually in my GitHub. Um, and uh, so when you look now at distributed computing and what all these different people are doing, um, to a certain extent, Web3 is just the reinvention of the wheel. Um, but um, the problem, as I see it with cryptocurrencies, is that they sought to just replicate all the worst parts of finance capitalism and usury as opposed to concentrating on the things that it really could be better at um, 
so in a way it was um, just exchanging well the old song that you know meet, meet the old new boss same as the old boss um, and so there's a failure of imagination the technology isn't a failure of imagination but there is a failure of imagination as to uh, the uses and possibilities that the new technologies can open up um, and part of that is obviously that um, it can be used for more freedom or it can be used for less freedom simply because uh, the information can be distributed in different ways and guided in different ways and so then we go back to the whole idea of the um, psychographics and, and Cambridge Analytica um, and so again you know is it free will or is it determinism and so how many degrees of freedom are there what are the choices in the boundary con conditions surrounding the uh, you know the so-called machine learning algorithms etc I mean these are all interesting questions um, uh, and as I say, our filters are such that a lot of this stuff is is quite hard to take in. So this is team building on polka dot, and I'm just gonna grab a copy of that and put it in my document here as I go along. Mash those. Okay. That one. What are we up to now? Now then, this one, Sparta released. How to claim your rewards? I had a good look at this. This was um, was an interesting become a validator. Now, where was it that I was reading about? Uh, I'm supposed to be a distributed network, and and it's um, proposing that people with the biggest stakes in a kind of an auction get to be these things they call validators who decide what can and cannot be published on this network now th these council members and I must say I I, um, I found that all a little bit elitist considering it's called Sparta as well and Sparta famously had two kings who were kept in check by the ephors um, and so effectively these guys have got e4s and the question in classical um, antiquity always was so who watches the e4s uh, which is not a bad question if you think about it so there we go so I'm, but I'm going to keep that because I wanted to give that some more thought and have a look at that um, I mean it's an early stage coin thing and uh, part of the thing that has occurred to me with um, these new platforms is when they come along with a coin attached and all the rest of it, you know, there are something like 1,300 separate coins already, um, all of which are perfectly fine for doing this stuff if they're convertible into something spendable. Um, and therefore, um, you don't need a token to to get these things going um, you just don't because um, if the technology works then really it, it uh, so anyway that's another question about all this stuff um, is that if you look at an individual thing as a standalone thing uh, that's one thing and therefore you would want your token and your token in theory gives you independence but if you look at it as a, a a symbiotic system whereby they're all contrib contributing in an anti-fragile way to the system um, I mean you could argue well you know you could have another coin might have another coin um, I I'm just skeptical that that's the way to go um, because there are so many of them um, and they all seem to me to do pretty much the same sort of thing uh, and so uh, uh, 
as with all these things, there, there, there are a million questions about each individual point. Um, just to get it down on, on paper, as it were, the point about application specific use cases for services, sales, hire, and use rights. or stuff is what you could call the real economy and tokens is the is the holding place the um, you know, money is, is, is merely an IOU um, so if you're providing stuff or a service or whatever um, at a national level you know, you're going to deal with the national currency. Um, the way that national currencies are done is not democratic um, and it's not fair. Uh, so you want to escape from that form of um, manipulation. Um, is having your own token a possibility? Well, of course, we know it's a possibility. Uh, but all these other tokens also exist um, and so you have to look at the basis that they come about and there are three basic ways they come about there are what they call pre-mined coins um, that's a central authority there are mined coins and there's kind of like a hybrid between the two and then you have um, the, the idea of of, 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 of going from mining to staking which is the hybrid that Ethereum has been talking about doing but has been finding quite hard to do um, now the question then becomes in and of themselves those tokens are tokens however they're, they're done however they're brought into existence all they are are manufactured receipts stuff is though stuff you know the work that you do is well you can only do that you know so many hours in the day as it were or there's only you know so many uh, bushels of corn produced in one year so uh, If you attach a token to your stuff and you're in control of your own token, how does that then match up against these other tokens? Is it better or is it worse? Well, well actually it's probably better because it's actually backed by something, but then how, how ubiquitous can it become? And so the, I suppose the, quest, the, the, the point becomes the people with the stuff need to federate into the tokens and, and I, and this is where all my work, I did a lot of work on a proposed um, federated currency called Largum, which was looking at the, um, the way they did money in the Hanseatic League. And um, so effectively, what brings value to the tokens is the, the real web 3 economy which is the stuff the services and all the rest of it which includes you know computer programming and stuff like that uh, but not the actual tokens the tokens remain a token it's not a it's not a thing in itself uh, and that's the the big cleavage between the thinking of what i call the bitcoin breadheads um, as opposed to the bitcoin entrepreneurs like a breadhead is not necessarily an entrepreneur because they're not doing stuff or a service and making it better and all of that stuff that we're told markets produce with competition and innovation and all this sort of thing. Um, so I found reading this Sparta stuff and Joy and their video platform and how they propose to govern it quite interesting. 
um, and um, I've got to say unconvincing um, but uh, it however unconvincing it was to me it may be convincing to you and and it remains interesting they are you know uh, it, it's kind of like a live experimentation uh, so but they're also behind the curve because um, already there is uh, Bittube which is doing pretty much the same thing and steam it which is doing pretty much the same thing which is the challenge that I have for my proposed publishing portal um, and what I would say about my proposed publishing portal is it's not going to have its own coin because it doesn't need one um, and uh, that's on the basis that people using it have got stuff and they're going to be exchanging that stuff and just accepting that other tokens that exist have value um, and basically they can choose the ones that have an immediate exchange value for day-to-day -day needs and my own preferred way of uh, then changing um, my cryptographic uh, uh, value into value to hold is through Volturo to convert it into gold um, and when Volturo start doing silver or someone else does into silver as well and holding those two uh, commodity monies um, and if someone uh, implemented Bernard Latier's Terra currency for instance I, I would be very interested in holding Terra the Terra because that's you know it's tangible um, and it's uh, uh, crypto tokens are intangible and um, they only have value as long as people have stuff that they'll accept for them so if you develop stuff and you're accept you, you know um, it's the stuff that has the value and therefore the value in the network are the people who are doing actual stuff um, and uh, it's a simple point but it's one that seems to pass so many people by perhaps because it is such a simple point so that's that then the next window here we've got to get um, There's a very interesting sign you got your name is Sparta, which has someone who's just been kicked in the groin. <laughs> um, right, so where are we now? Parity substrata. There's Gav again. Good old Gav. Um, let's put that in. I have got parity on my computer. Um, I'm going to go back and have another look at that another time. Um, so a bit of the old cult of personality going on there, Gav. Um, yes, we can. Very Obama-esque with the colours as well. Um, Biggest bet against chain maximalism. The nerves of the world is united. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Right, where are we? Um, let's just copy that link there. We will come back to that too. dot token after all I've just been saying about tokens um, so much of this stuff is repetition so much of it is just retreaded money for old rope it has to be said um, 
and yeah Operation Game Theory incentivize token holders to behave in honest ways. Good actors are rewarded by this mechanism while bad actors lose their stake in the network. This ensures the network stays secure. Right, well I am not a great fan of game theory, I've gotta tell you. Um It is but one view of human nature, I mean it has developed, but um, it is the product of one. I mean that said, I, I like Schubert's work, I mean, uh, but, um, anyway that's polka dot, let's just, um, the reason these things are relevant to Cambridge Analytica and to the narrative behind the narrative um, is that uh, no one knows where this all ends up or where indeed we're going but we do know the direction of travel and the direction we're moving in and um, so big themes climate change carbon currency uh, 5G um, internet of things uh, federalization right down to the city-state level and getting rid of um, nations and really I mean in a way we're turning citizens uh, 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 citizens have been turned into consumers who in turn with this lot are being turned into hashes now you can look at that one way I'm not a number I'm a free man I'm not a number I'm a hash is a hash the same as a free man well a hash can provide the protections of anonymity um, in theory up to a point um, and uh, so those are three big themes here which um, are emerging um, as the narrative behind the narrative what is the overarching uh, direction of travel and what are the strong currents we can identify in the current narratives um, on, on the surface level to see what's happening sort of you know un, uh, underneath in, in those currents another strong theme that I've come to over the past few months is looking at the in this water metaphor or this body of water um, is the idea that the water in the, the fish tank is being changed and you know there's the old maxim that you know that the fish doesn't know the water it swims in until it, you take it away um, and in modern commerce the water we all swim in is money um, and we take it for granted uh, and if the way that money is done is changed are they changing the water which is kind of happening at the moment and on this point, um, on my laptop, I, I did save it, there was um, a video of um, Stiglitz telling us all that, well, we should get rid of cryptocurrencies, don't, don't like them at all. And of course, the dollar is a wonderful thing. It's done very well, but it should be more digital. Uh, it was a disingenuous um, thing, I must say. Um, let me just, uh, I don't want to open new windows as I'm going along, so all I'm going to say is at this point, I'm going to just uh, make a note, Stiglitz, get rid of crypto, Twitter, TNC segment. I did download, I know it's on my hard drive, so that's that there. Again, so there you go. Um, Uncle Joe, Joseph Stiglitz. Right, so that's Stiglitz. Polka dot overview. What have we got next?
my niece in tea with Max. Five G versus climate change. That's a question I put to Ranger myself the other day. Um, there's a bank holiday in Britain yesterday. I might be talking to Ranger later. Notifications. Near a tickle over. Eight years of positive money. Positive money. Who have had the putsch by the green NGO complex. Yeah, so there we are. Um, uh, financial eye, see the 5G with go. That's um, Ranjan's blog. I've had some interesting conversations with Ranjan about the speech of rebellion and other things. I leave that question in there because it is a good question. I did retweet that. Um, they say 5G is very bad for your health and bad for the environment um, and uh, for carbon based life forms. Um, and it's way more damaging to, 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 to everybody and everything than CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, but, uh, there you go. That's that. Uh, now, now that's there, I'm just going to find this uh, Piglets thing when that's open because it's not opening any window if you just switch one. Because what I did, I know I responded to it because I put the episode of the Greatest Scam, episode 4 of the Hidden Secrets of Money, the Mike Malone thing, so uh, I haven't done much tweeting today. Uh, that's the one. There she blows. So I'm just gonna. There's my little Stiglitz priest of usury. Mmm, get you. Come on, mate. What are we doing here? Wait. Don't plan just to copy that. Because, uh, seriously. It, it's worth making, watching, but do have your sick bag handy, is all I would say to that. I'll get through these very quick because this is still struggling. Come on. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, so annoying. There we are. Copy link to Twitter. Thank you. And then I'm just going to put that in star. There she blows. Safe. Okay, anyone who stumbles on this stream, I'm just going through. Uh, to get some windows closed. I've been working on this stuff for about three days and I wanted to get some notes down um, and this i found is a good way of doing it. If I stream live and talk I can then use the, the transcript as fuller notes to actually um, refer back to at a later date etc. Um, so right that's there so we can close that one now Okay, Mon Money Network. Oh, this is good. This one is. Um, article by Michael Hudson, a friend sent yesterday. 
so this is uh, the exponential function it's mis much misunderstood and little known uh, let's just put what that is about there and close that window what have we got here that's the same thing Right, Sadamaram. Okay, uh, that's on my LinkedIn. This is the guy, the CEO of uh, BitTube. Uh, we were just looking at Sparta and Joy and all of that sort of thing. Well, um, these guys are already there, um, and it, I've got a channel on it. It seems to work very well. And if we go up here, look and see. Uh, that's an interesting up here. Uh, here is the BitTube app in Chrome, uh, and pays tubes for people to watch your videos and videos that you watch, and you can then put them in your wallet and and uh, exchange them. Um, and so it's sort of a self. This is the idea of where you have. A service and you have your own coin and it becomes kind of self perpetuating you can mine this coin and uh, I mean the mining I get um, and I suppose if you're going to do it you would federate it and you would make your coin exchangeable for any other coin so for instance I should be able to buy their coin with another coin that I'm able to mine which also supports the network say Ethereum or something else um, and that kind of works uh, it's, it's another layer but not, not, not another layer of complexity but another layer of uh, subsidiarity in a way or uh, mutuality um, so that's that's the point going back to the Sparta thing and the point I was making about um, real stuff and the tokenization side of things so people with real stuff can accept tokens or they can issue tokens the exchangeability and applicability of those tokens in other um, stuff based projects as opposed to mere token based or exchange based products it's a really interesting question that needs developing a little further but both Steam and BitTube already have an instance of, of this um, and uh, IPFS have got Filecoin which is kind of storage and that sort of works because the storage means that uh, uh, you know that your files are going to be available and so they will download slightly quicker or a lot quicker in some cases. Um, it, so note to self yet again, um, re-examine my earlier work on Largom and Fores um, and the distributing of applications with real tangible service and stuff, time and labour, uh, skin in the game uh, things as opposed to the for a for a medium that is supposed to disintermediate a token is really just a intermediary without corporeal form as it were it's a digital intermediary 
as opposed to a trusted third party intermediary but it's it's no less controlled who is benefiting from that distributed intermediary token and it's a question to develop and go back to so I'm just going to make a note at this point in my notes of that point when we're looking at uh, BitTube so BitTube Tube Distributed Intermediary Tokens Instead of Intermediary Institutions or Persons Legal Fictions or Otherwise So that's uh, that's an interesting thought there, and uh, I've connected with Adam and I'm on um, LinkedIn. Cool. So that's that. Okay. okay so next we have. All right, IBPBC roadmap. This is the roadmap for BitTube or the organisation behind it. Beta version, first of the international launch, bug fixing, API, friendly time, mobile app, uh, copyright, L detection, content forking system. Integration system, engine for bits, mobile app, beta, smart TV solution, basically for mining to pay. Right, okay. Right, um, let's just put that link in here anyway. Interesting choice of icons there from a planetary, interplanetary file system, I suppose. Very droll, very droll. Okay, so. Next up, we have. No, this is Paper Lee. This is my Ethereum news paper, which generates automatically. Um, in fact, it's thrown up some very interesting articles over the years. Um, yeah, I read this thing yesterday Bitcoin testing 6,000 level will justify a real surge in cryptocurrency optimism. I mean, that is like reading tea leaves um, and it's this one too here's why ethereum is in the early stages of possible mega rally uh, there is so much nonsense that these people talk um, it's divorced from the real stuff in the world and skin in the game um, And it goes back to what we're saying about Van Neumann's elephant, um, which is coming up as well. But anyway, that's the Paper Lee newspaper, which is it's an interesting way of actually finding different things to read that don't come up in the Google search algorithms or some of the other search engines. Um, and uh, so that served me quite well. It's been coming out for a couple of years now. Right, refined medium, video content blockchain. Now this is the one with the video content and uh, network of moderators. So this is the network of moderators again. Um, was this related to Sparta or not? I'm not it's very similar in, in its conception. Um, and with what it's trying to do uh, is clearly not going to have first movers advantage because that is um, 
Well, there's DTube, there's BitChute, and there is BitTube. Um, and here it's interesting to note the difference between cloud-based computing and distributed computing. They are different. Um, cloud-based computing is still a, a server-based um, model, albeit with multiple single points of failure as opposed to one point of failure. Um, distributed computing is uh, potentially has full subsidiarity. Ev every node, ev every terminal on the on the network um, acting autonomously or in concert. So um, it's a difference of degree rather than of kind. Um, although in some respects it's a difference of kind. Um, I would say it's more a difference of degree rather than kind. Um, so there we are, refined medium, uh, blah, how it works. I'm just going to get that off there. And um, let's just put that there. Let's see, this is, they have their own token as well. Um, this interoperability of tokens is a very interesting question. Right, refine me. Right, so let's just uh, copy that and put it here. Vision, blah, blah. Okay. White paper and all of that. I'm just, we've got what that is, so we're just going to close these windows and. I mean, I started reading this. They're based in Hong Kong, these people, and I don't know if it's just a language thing, but I, I found it a little, a little bit unconvincing. I mean, I, I've read lots of these white papers over the years, and um, uh, uh, so much of it is retreaded, regurgitated, fairly bland stuff it has to be said and I'm afraid I felt that fell into that category as does this which I'm just gonna copy and put into my notes anyway um, alright okay so we're going to start getting to some of the political stuff now. Here's John Ward on the slog, who um, is talking about the forthcoming crisis with the Italian banks, which may well push Deutsche Bank over the edge. And uh, it's it's an interesting scenario that, that John builds there. Um, of course, the question is how long can the can be continued to be kicked down the road um, and I think the answer to that is indefinitely at the moment um, and it will cease to be kicked down the road whenever what is lined up takes place of what has effectively ceased to be believable but is still believed because of things like psychographics um, and this is where my view of the carbon-based currency uh, and debt-based carbon currency and the Green New Deal, which isn't a left-wing thing, I don't think. It's, uh, it's a wing of the oligarchy that actually sees things playing out that way. And I think it's the anti-human wing, if you like, that... Um, the BBC were running stories yesterday about you know a million species 
will be becoming extinct and all of this. If you read Cory Morningstar's latest article uh, on Extinction Rebellion and um, its uh, emotion-based persuasion methods, um, and it posts a long video of Roger Hallam, who I must say I, I find him very difficult to listen to. I don't know, it's just, just uh, it's so devoid of content. But this, you know, uh, Corey's found this clip where he's actually kind of explaining himself, and, and um, that's the idea to be devoid of con content and just to wind people up, you know. Um, but operating on the basis that there isn't a plan and that, you know, um, things aren't working, they don't know they're not working, all the rest of it. I, I think there is a plan and, and things aren't working because they're not supposed to be working. Um, or the other way of looking at it is things are working perfectly well because uh, wealth is becoming more concentrated and with such concentration of wealth it's possible to extinguish more and more competition. Um, and now we're left with um, the Russia, China, Washington consensus, NATO, um, and Syria and Iran, Myanmar and uh, the South China Sea, um, North Korea, Ukraine. These points of resistance to this centralised, financialised, monopolised conception of uh, global neoliberal fascism basically so um, yeah I mean uh, it's like Vinny says in uh, the big short you know I don't have faith in the system um, and uh, you know, be like Vinny that's an interesting article all the same um, and I think lots of people may think John is quite cynical but I just don't think he's cynical enough um, so I mean I really agree about lots of things um, uh, and um, the direction of travel You know, what, are there any black swans coming up? Black swans, you know, the Taleb's black swans. Um, and who knows? I don't know. Um, right, so what have we got next? Okay, that is just stuff. Right, that's the live dashboard. That's the live dashboard. Um, okay, next. Right, that's the novel. There's notes for outline planning. You can see I've got 115,000 words in total there, and it's finished up to chapter 4. I've got the chapter anyway. Um, so, let's just close that. Then we come to a series of blog posts which I was going through which picks up these different themes that we've been talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk about each one because it will take forever uh, but this is kind of like um, overview time and uh, pulling together my reading um, from the last eight, nine years. Um, so I'm just going to take the headings in with each link um, and put those in here as we go along. Um, okay. Uh, bam. I'm 
and obviously I've been reading these things and jogging my memory over the past <coughs> three or four days um, and then all this has culminated actually in reading David Icke's 2001 book The Biggest Secret um, and I've got his other work to read as well um, and uh, I wanted to tackle the notion of whether or not David Icke is, as he is accused of being, a, an anti-Semite based on what he's written, because I hadn't read his work before, but I have listened to him a lot and watched his talks, um, and I never got the impression that he was an anti-Semitic, and I must admit from reading what I've read so far um, of The Biggest Secret, uh, I can see why people might be upset about what he's saying, but it's certainly not anti-Semitic, not in my view, anyway. Um, so, yeah, challenging uh, people's sort of deeply held beliefs and truth claims um, is always going to upset people. Um, and... Uh, I mean, obviously, he's managed to do that, um, but I don't know why a Muslim or a Christian or a Satanist or any number of other people wouldn't be, you know, as offended as Jewish people from what he's written, because he, you know, I mean, it, um, and, and, and he separates the person and the person's self-identity from the actual thesis that he puts forward. And the thesis that he puts forward, however incredible, it, it seems, and, and I, 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 I'm unconvinced because, you know, basically for such an incredible claim, you'd have to have some pretty hard evidence. Um, so this is, you know, the hybrid lizard type idea. And he says himself in his own writing, I'm going to say this anyway because I believe it. And, and uh, you know, I'm not saying you have to believe it, but I, I, I do. And then people say, well, that's a front. He's, when he says lizards, he actually means Jewish people. But it's quite clear if you read it, he doesn't just mean Jewish people. Um, although in the Abrahamic faith, Judaism is, you know, the first one that comes along, then it's Christianity, then it's Islam, but there's also Mithraism, uh, uh, Hinduism, all manner of other religions, and the religions before that that he goes into, and um, they're all issues that... Peter Joseph covers it in, in the first Lightgeist movie where he talks about, well, actually Son of God and the, the coincidences of different um, cultures and prior civilizations having very similar mythologies and archetypes. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't think I, I, and I never have thought, and I still don't think, that David Icke is anti-Semitic. Um, and I would also say, so what if he is? So what if someone's an anti-Semite? So what if someone's a racist? So what if someone's a sexist? You know, so what if someone's anti gammonish or whatever, you know, a gammonist? Um, I, don't, I don't care. As long as they don't act upon their hatred and, and actually... advocate and go out and encourage um, violence or other criminal acts against those people based on you know their own prejudices I you know I I, I don't think you can have or prosecute thought crime I, I, it, it, it's not a good place to go and free speech and banning speech, then you get to the thought crime thing, 
And then the next step is, of course, with all this psycho graphics and what have you, and going back to point one about Cambridge Analytica and this manipulation and all the rest of it, well, you know, hold on a second. Um, who is anyone to tell anyone else what they can think? Um, so, you know, Rabbi Hillel said, you know, that um, the Torah could be summed up as do unto others as you have done to yourself and the rest is just commentary. Now, um, And the other thing that David Icke says, which is quite, I think, wise, is he talks about love and that, you know, love is the thing. And I agree with that. So um, uh, it's hard to find people that, that will disavow, you know, love as a thing or a good thing. Um, and um, if people are incapable or rendered incapable of loving, and empathy and uh, s selfless acts um, you know where does that psychopathy come from um, and you know what are the you know, what are the explanations for that um, and kind of going way back you know um, why are we here? How are we here? Foundation myths, all the rest of it. Um, even scientific foundation myths like the Big Bang Theory or even the theory of evolution. These are theories. The theory of fossil fuels. The, you know, the, the, um, so this idea of scientific modelling, scientific mathic, mathing, mathematical modelling, psychographics, predictive programming, um, mind control, all of these topics um, kind of interweave and, and, and can overwhelm. And if you look to get some sort of overarching framework, and these ideas are frameworks of understanding, um, and we're going to get to Van, Neumann, Von, Von, Von Neumann's elephant in a minute, um, when you get Thomas Kuhn said something like this when you get two people um, proposing uh, a different explanation for the same set of data or the same facts that is then metaphysics and not, not science um, so you then get into all of the Rupert Sheldrake stuff about scientism and the um, the science delusion. Then you get into Dawkins and memes and the God delusion and um, you know who knows what else. Um, And I happen to agree with David Graeber. He wrote an ex excellent article in The Commoner in 2005, post the second B George Bush II election victory against um, uh, oh, what's he called now? Um, he was Secretary of State, John Kerry. Um, against John Kerry, why did John Kerry lose and, and win? And, and um, in that quite long essay, which you'll find linked to on my blog in various places, um, the explanation for Kerry losing to Bush, you know, apart from sort of incumbent's advantage, um, I mean, Kerry lost for similar reasons to why. Um, Clinton lost to uh, to Donald Trump, um, 
back in 2005 though I think people were less hysterical about it and there was in many ways there was more to be hysterical about say even in um, 2000 with all the hanging scads and all the rest of it um, so again when you come back to Cambridge Analytica and their supposed help for the you know they started off helping Tom Cruise apparently I mean it's a big gravy train that thing there's a lot of money in, in, in the American election cycle it's, a, it's an industry in itself uh, watch the film Primary Colours to get some sort of flavour um, so anyway as I say um, this one here World Governance and Professor Etimov here very interesting now Egro 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 Egregore is the concept represented thought form or collective group mind, an autonomous psychic entity made up of and influencing thoughts of a group of people. <laughs> really interesting stuff. Um, of course, listen to Gabriel Gatehouse's chat and then this Channel 4 set of programme about a year later, where they're talking about all the infographics and what have you. And you get, you know, um, Back in 2001, when David Icke wrote the um, the biggest lie or the biggest truth, whatever it's called, um, actually, let's just just have a look here. Um, indeed, what is it called? Uh, The biggest secret, that's it. The biggest secret. Um, and obviously the, the famous Wogan interview. Um, those were much more innocent days before the internet kind of took off and where memory holding and marginalizing um, seditious thought against you know the the power structures of state uh, w w was more easily suppressed in some ways, um, or let's put it a bit harder to disseminate, harder to get distributed into a network. Um, and so, here, you know, in a way, this is where the internet is a kind of a an own goal, and the distributed internet could be an attempt by the elites to. Uh, neutralize their own goal or it could be a uh, multiplication and consolidation of that own goal um, uh, depending on how we pick it up and run with it but that rests with all of us individually and you know in groups in open source world to actually do that um, and uh, it seems to me that that's that's what David Icke is saying, um, and to a certain extent, it doesn't matter who who or why or what is opposing the wish for human self-actualization and self-ownership, liberty, and you know, well. The pursuit of happiness, you know, the, the things at the end of the American Constitution. If people are opposing those, um, or organisations, or um, state actors, or the boogeyman under the bed, it doesn't matter who it is. What matters is what we do and what we consent to that's that's the bottom line at the end of the day and so we need to look at the available tool toolbox and, and and use it according to what our own best consciences actually um tell us uh and that takes a certain amount of personal courage um and it's it's understandable why many people would be um reluctant to expose themselves or their families to the 
well, certainly the sort of ridicule that David Icke suffered from the system at the beginning of his, uh, he called it a nuclear strike, his kind of um, awakening of consciousness or whatever. And I, I read that bit uh, last night, I was having a bit of a read of, 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 of uh, The Biggest Secret. But anyway, there, there we are, that's, that's, that's this one here. Um, I'm supposed to be cracking on through these to get some of these windows shut. Uh, here we are, calculating the local elections. So this is where we started the other short video which I'd already done. So we should really be able to crack on through these ones to get to the more recent bits. Pace there. Right, this next one's an excellent article. Um, by John Curtis and Stephen Fisher, which is about the projected share of the national vote. I did a couple of blogs on this question. Um, and a few other statisticians, and I sent a tweet to uh, an American statistician or political scientist uh, as well, related to the local elections in 2000. And 16, I think, um, and as per pro the 2017 general election, etc. Um, but again, this is just another data manipulation exercise or uh, selection bias exercise. Uh, um, I'm very fond of the Karl Rove active in history um, thing. There's a really good video actually on YouTube of Alex Jones storm um, door stopping uh, Carl uh, 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 Carl Rove at, at an airport somewhere um, when he is actually in I think it was Bush who was working for at the time maybe it was Clinton I don't know uh, actually sort of saying you know what's this uh, act of in history to the that's the first time I, I ever came across it was saying oh, I thought well, that's interesting what's he, what's he accusing him of what's what's this now and uh, yeah, it's, it's a, an interesting one. I don't know if it's been removed from YouTube. It'll be there somewhere. In fact, I'm sure there's a link to it on one of my blogs here. New US Grand Geopolitical Strategy. This is a Thierry Nyson uh, thing. Pretty long title, this one. But um, This is part of the changing of the paradigm sort of thing. And is Trump one of them or one of us? Um, you know, was... You know, has he been compromised, or was it always supposed to be this way? I mean, with Obama, um, you know, was he compromised, or did he do what he was supposed to do all along? Tony Blair, same question. Trudeau, same question. Macron, same question. Right, now, this is a um, blog, Clive Lord, his blog occasionally comes to my timeline I have a look at it sometimes this was a hustings for a local election uh, for the EU elections um, in York and Humber and uh, yeah I mean I, I uh, Clive lately has taken to call himself special and he seems to have diagnosed himself with the same uh, condition as Greta Thorpe <laughs> Uh, and for some reason he thinks that means that that's why he can understand climate change and the rest of us can't. Um, and some people have actually been saying that about Greta Thunberg as well. And, and uh, sorry, it just doesn't wash. If you want other people to understand your arguments, you have to make your arguments. And your arguments have not been made in a convincing way for CO2 being the control knob on cl climate. And until you can do that, and I don't think you will ever be able to do that, uh, your arguments will not win the day. Hence why Extinction Rebellion uh, campaign on emotion and communicate on emotion. And every single talk you find of the so-called climate communicators all say that. Stay away from the numbers, stay away from the science, and appeals to emotion or what will get you home um, and uh, 
in a democratic society that just isn't good enough um, and it comes down to the question of do we have evidence based policy making or policy based evidence making and what climate science is is policy based evidence making once it has been distilled into the uh, political reports and summaries for policy makers in the IPCC if you dig down into the science um, many scientists have resigned from positions at IPCC because they disagree with that stage of the summaries for policy makers and the lead authors who write them who very often do not have the scientific background uh, but have a background in climate communication political communication and the sort of politics which is engaged in by Cambridge Analytica and Cambridge Analytica is the rule it is not the exception and again this is why one should look very carefully at those films contemporaneous with the story having been broken not so much what they do say but what they don't say not so much who they criticize but who they don't criticize and the question needs to be asked if them then who else not if them why didn't these other people do it these other people were doing it but why are these people who are being called out for doing it being challenged and there's a very simple answer for that and that is that the electorate gave the wrong answer on Brexit and the wrong answer on President Trump and the elitist establishment don't like it they um, their manipulations had have not worked and now they have to come up with an alternative narrative which is very very hard to do when the illusion of choice and democracy has pacified um, not the masses that there's there's the unheard third the third of people who never vote and just don't vote at all then you've got the next third or the you know the floating group maybe they will maybe they won't the higher turnouts tend to have more radical outcomes uh, and, and and therefore a lot of the messaging has been to encourage lower turnouts. It'll be very interesting in the European elections in Europe what the average turnouts are, because if they're higher, it will go more nationalist. Uh, if they're lower, it will remain more federalist and, and truly fascist. So um, it's these are interesting questions and. Uh, that's why that was there. Um, Zero Hedge the Huff Post for Armchair Anarcho Capitalist Preppers. Again, I applied to be able to comment on Zero Hedge, and again, I've heard nothing. Um, for whatever reason, I'm not considered a suitable person to comment and join in the discussion on Zero Hedge. Um, and that was a blog I did comparing Zero Hedge to the Huffington Post <laughs> uh, and uh, calling it out as a gatekeeper. Uh, Newport by election. So, this is my Web3 work, um, and I've discovered various other interesting websites and. Um, ways of doing this stuff. Uh, governance in blockchain world is quite an interesting question uh, and consensus and all this sort of thing. Um, so this is sort of some of the applied sort of stuff that can come out of Web3 and I've been working on this with John Ward from the Slog. Uh, What else we got? Ecological Red Power. This is personal destiny control. It was interesting to see earlier that um, 
person of destiny control was actually a theme in the polka dot website. Oh, something's happened there. Copy. Copy. Interesting. This is uh, Mogherini, the uh, Minister of War for the EU, in a speech she gave uh, on the UK column channel. Commitment to a more cooperative, multilateral new world order. Um, and she isn't slipping, she's saying that more and more often. And, and what it basically is, is, is uh, Boris Johnson always refers to the rules-based international order because the new world order has uh, you know different connotations um, these days uh, so there you go what is happening here i don't understand Energy economy renewables, right? So this is interesting. Energy, energy is a very interesting question, and energy is far more important to our prosperity than money. So when we talk about cryptocurrencies, when we talk about you know tokens for facilitating exchange, intermediary tokens, etc., um, we really have to understand that the economy is an energy transfer uh, 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 transformation equation um, as well as a socio-political construct um, and uh, the possibility for abundant energy um, is actually one that was already fulfilled because what has cheap oil been what has abundant oil provided it's provided abundant energy uh, for uh, a period a considerable period of the 20th century um, and questions about energy abundance and social control through debt are the real questions I think that we should be considering and are particularly pertinent to the disintermediation of social control mechanisms such as uh, global banking, large banking, international banking, central banking and of course um, governments and government taxation etc. Tax farming, tax farming is a very interesting question um, and the privatisation of uh, state institutions, um, commodification of nature, but commodification of natural monopolies. Uh, all very interesting questions, um, which, which uh, throw back into the mix at the current, what I would say is a paradigm shift answering um, John Ward's question in his latest blog on uh, you know, the, the, the local difficulties of his three Italian banks and particularly how that will affect Deutsche Bank. Um, right, oh, this one is, uh, this tweet got me banned on Twitter for a day. Um, again, I'm going to pretty bad Anglo-Saxon language I suppose, but uh, it's an interesting one, an interesting one. Okay, military industrial complex then, again stepping out of the shadows, I mean I've been venturing that we're in a kind of a, the age of the Washington Consensus Banana Republic, kind of we're all South American now. Uh, 
So again, that's another part of the theme, military industrial complex, which will lead us into Mark Sedwell. So Mark Sedwell's talk to the Atlantic Council, which was in March 8th, 2019. Do watch that and then look at the um, videos connected to the Francis Leader articles on Steam It regarding um, the US military industrial complex and its connection both to climate change narratives and to uh, you know, petrodollar finance um, initiatives and its conceptualization of markets etc. Um, and these themes are also taken up recently by Brian Gerrish in UK Column and by John Ward on the slog um, and they're very very pertinent to this dynamic between uh, elected officials, the executive that we're told we have in the House of Commons, the role of the House of Lords but also the role of the technocrats that used to be bureaucrats um, and the power which Mark Sidwell now wields uh, and the question is who is he wielding that power for um, so uh, yep that's that's why that one is there then next what have we got what's the next one here Sunday bloggers this was a compilation post I did um, and uh, control file is the interesting word there regarding how um, one gets a politician that's talking out of turn back on the reservation uh, and Gavin Williamson obviously has been you know thrown out of the brownies and uh, so forth so It will be interesting to see if, as touted, uh, Williamson stands up and makes his uh, Geoffrey Howe uh, savaged by a sheep speech uh, against Theresa May. Um, or whether what I think is likely to happen is that a deal with Corbyn and May will be struck, but it will be along the lines of a unity government whereby um, I think there's a high likelihood that Corbyn will step aside, there'll be a new leader of the Labour Party, possibly Tom Watson, possibly someone else. John McDonnell will become Chancellor in the new uh, thing. There'll be a pro, pro quo on austerity, and I think Jeremy Hunt will be appointed as the Conservative leader uh, and the Prime Minister. Um, and that he will be in charge of implementing the Brino solution for Britain to re-enter the, uh, the EU um, and uh, that then is also predicated on the neocons continuing to neutralise the Trump America first agenda um, and promulgating the war agenda and bringing that forward so there's quite a lot to pick out of of those scenarios um, but the in the final analysis uh, the establishment including the EU establishment want to maintain the union of Britain uh, but to have a more federal Britain and so I think you'll see um, Federal Bank of England and you'll see a, a, a new English Assembly being neutered as well which all plays into the uh, fragmentation of national power into kind of city like the old corporations that used to run the country under the Parliament when things were more devolved but the financialise it's, it's kind of poll tax on steroids um, and so you're basically going to have the EU uh, implementing the equivalent to the parliaments of Europe to what 
Margaret Thatcher instituted in terms of rate capping and bringing local finances under the central government umbrella and that is happening at a pan-European level um, and it's happened also in the United States in terms of uh, how increased federal power has, has, has subtracted from state powers. They've had more of a problem with the, the United States in, 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 in implementing these ideas uh, because the initial starting point from the Constitution um, had kind of checked the boxes um, and the Founding Fathers were largely against the idea of a centralised banking model which is something that has changed over the uh, ensuing couple of centuries uh, but in the UK um, and in Europe the banking model is clearly more established uh, but also the centralisation, what happened post First and Second World War, and, and, and now what is happening ahead of the slated potential Third World War, um, and of course the BRICS Bank um, and the Russian-Chinese kind of axis, uh, which is resisting the unipolar um, petrodollar-based hegemony, moving away from the petrodollar to a carbon-based type debt-based currency again is something which um, there's a considerable uh, dispute amongst the oligarchs themselves as to you know basically who has more pull in that ultimate world so um, effectively Russian oligarchs are no better than our own oligarchs and Russian politicians including P Putin are no better than our own uh, politicians but it's better for all of us that the Putins exist and that the Chinese do, and, and it's better that they are all balancing each other in the same way that in the Cold War um, where you have competition for slightly different systems, they all have to show their best face, which is better for the people. Woe betide us all if they settle their differences and then turn their fire on us, because, you know, on that basis we haven't seen anything yet, is, it would be my, um, my estimation. Um, and I, I think the analysis doesn't have to go any further than straightforward geopolitic political power politics real politics i don't think you have to go any deeper than that you know um uh the essay earlier by michael um hudson uh is very good if you read that um it does explain how once wealth becomes centralised and there's positive interest rates, ultimately um, all the wealth reserves all the purchasing power to itself and those in the stuff economy basically are stuffed. So again, this is a part of the point that I'm making about the real stuff and the tokens. And if you want the distributed web and the cryptocurrency idea of disintermediating it makes and you have to disintermediate the financial instrument of money um, and uh, uh, enable um, you know direct exchanges between people um, and, and you kind of the, the settlement process as opposed to being a central clearing house of checks uh, which are basically you know um, that's kind of how the clearing system of banks works. You have a clearing system for stuff via these tokens and the tokens are mere, um, they're, they're basically units of account. And so then the next thing I need to say about unit of account is look at quanta and look at Wes um, Freeberg's work on the Big Apple plan quanta and the idea of a unit of account which um, allows for multiple types of currencies, you know, as many of those as you like. It's the honesty and the immutability of the unit of account which is important. And the unit of account of quanta is based on uh, the Planck constant, which is an energy constant which doesn't change. And one quanta 
is equivalent to, I think it's about a, a, a hundred watts of electricity or something. Um, but if you look at that, um, the point is, is that a unit of energy is a unit of energy is a unit of energy. A unit of currency is not a unit of currency. A unit of currency, it changes over time. And the quantities and what have you change. But, you know, um, it's a really, really important point. Um, and, uh, right, so that means that will now be in my notes. Um, right, what's that in there? That, that some Trojan's got in, and it keeps throwing up that. Dang it, let's just go back here. Right, okay, now this is a website. Um, Right, you can look at that if you want to. There's quite a lot of upsetting stuff on that, and um, it does seem to me to be a website that is overly concerned about whether people are Jewish or not. Uh, which, um, you know, uh, I mean, I've, well, I, I, when I read, I read that w like website, and I've read it for years, and I've always been troubled by the fact that I do think it's anti-Semitic, uh, but it does have some good information on it. And I just go back to what I said earlier, it's anti-Semitic, so what, you know, um, that exists, racism, all these things exist, I don't agree with them, and I think people that sort of succumb to that kind of thinking are the people who are, you know, they're the people who are harmed by it, as long as they don't act on it, in which case I would prosecute them, but, you know, if, if, if people believe that shit, it's quite easy to point out where their reasoning is flawed um, and if you can't be bothered to do that then just ignore them if they bother you then sure um, I bother you with threats with violence or with harassment and all the rest of it that's a different question um, but anyway as I say I mean it, it, it's uh, you have to put your filters on to read through some of the stuff, but but it does open quite a lot of interesting doors, um, which um, you know they're not doors I'd ever want to walk through, but they're certainly ones which you can peer through and kind of think, ah, if that's what's going on behind that door, that kind of makes sense over here. So that's that one there. <coughs> Right, this then comes back to Holocaustianity and um, what have you, and this uh, Brexit Unentangled post which I did, which covers a lot of these different aspects of the tool. Now, as it's a general kind of clear up and clearing up, it's kind of a clearing of my cache, if you like, to. to, to um, discover the different contexts in which I've encountered different information and to re-look at information with the new information. Um, inconvenient truths is MSM all in with the lies on everything. Uh, so that's one of my Steam posts with lots of links in there. So I'm going to put that in here too. Um, that's another sort of little... Uh, aphorism about you know there are no answers but we can hopefully ask better questions and uh, again that's part of what this process is um, okay holocaust controversies there we go We've just had Easter. Um, okay, so that's that. I've done another bunch of posts about chosenness and chosenness in uh, uh, Calvinism, uh, which is um, what's it called? Predestiny or um, uh, unconditional elec election, which is not dissimilar to you know, being the chosen people and stuff. Um, Thierry Mason, Mason wrote an article which I found on Wikispooks talking about uh, 
how Calvinism and Zionism, going all the way back to Cromwell and of course then William of Orange and stuff, it was a very, very interesting article. Um, and uh, then you come to, you know, if you challenge um, historical factual aspects of the Holocaust as presented by uh, institutions dedicated to never forgetting, and I don't think we should ever forget, uh, but if you challenge um, like Nick Collistrom did, um, or other people have, um, some of the methodologies of, 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 of how all these people were murdered, or indeed how many people were in fact murdered. Uh, just to give you some idea, I mean, people like um, oh, what's he called? Um, the ex Daily Mirror bloke um, that's now on breakfast television. Uh, he always says, it's, I think I heard him say, eight million Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust, which simply isn't credible. Um, and then um, I think the Holocaust Memorial Museum now has a figure, I'm not sure if it's three million or 1.5 million. Uh, I think it's three million. Um, and uh, there are also various statistical studies that have been done based on record keeping from before the Second World War and after the Second World War. Um, there was a Swedish statistician that did some work on that as well. Um, and uh, my view on this is, is that if people are having arguments about these things, and even if, if people are saying things that are basically not true, or trying to say, you know, such and such a thing didn't happen if someone wants to say well actually that's correct that didn't happen but this did happen and it happened this way that sort of clarification um, personally I think it's important I'm, I'm interested in facts and provable facts um, I mean no one has to prove to me that Belton existed I, I visited when I was you know, when I was eight years old and had a real deep effect on me but um, there is other information about Belson, how the Belson story was presented after the fact, um, and other uh, facts about the Second World War, which aren't related to uh, Bergen Belson and aren't related to Auschwitz. Um, but which we do know were suppressed in the press and, and, and so by by emphasizing one uh, appalling fact uh, to diminish or hide another appalling fact you know one can see how um, different stories do get distorted in different ways so books to me like the gas chambers of Sherlock Holmes or um, Nicholas Collistrum's um, uh, book about you know that got him to all that trouble. I I don't see what anybody's objection is to reading them or you know um, or, or David Icke for that matter. As it, as it happens, I don't think David Icke is anti-Semitic. I don't think Nicholas Collistrum is. Um, I, I think that um, Shablos is. Um, she's the one that wrote the you know offensive song. Um, but again, I said, well, I don't, you know, if she wants to write songs like that, it's up to her. She wants to use her undoubted musical talent in that way. You know, I, I just won't listen to it. You know, I think it is offensive and it's in bad taste, but I don't think she should have been taken to court for it. Um, and in fact, I think the attempts to undermine her ability to earn a living and all the rest of it actually made her even more offensive uh, you know it drives 
we can drive people to the margins that's what happens that shouldn't be any surprise so yeah I mean it's um, it, it, when uh, you know when one considers these things but anyway that's that's that post you read it if you like and, and um, but it's part of my thinking and, you know it's the one of my posts starts you know one of the very good things that Voltaire has rec Voltaire would reckon never to have said is, is to find out um, who's in charge, find out who, who you're not allowed to criticise. This guy made an interesting uh, film when he was a much younger man, um, which got him into a lot of controversy um, in the United States. And then he turned up to the <laughs> Republican Party fundraiser, this guy David Sting. Um, anyway, it's an interesting article, it's worth, worth reading. It's, it's, uh, it's actually quite a comical episode in many ways. Um, but, um, Obviously, the subject matter isn't funny at all, but but the uh, you know the, the the absurdity and irony of some of these things uh, they're, they're, it is it's quite it is quite funny in a dark way. Uh, so then that goes all to sort of. Um, various episodes which um, of censorship and prosecutions and basically miscarriages of du justice in my view um, but uh, if you start with him um, you will find in stuff like this um, so what really happened in so this, these are the decrypts which um, Colostrum talks a lot about. You know, it has to be said, I mean, it, it, nobody made these documents up. They're kind of all there, and uh, you know, the sorts of things that David Irving quotes from and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, as I say, I mean, I'm if you want to find out, stuff rather than be told what, what to think about what, what's available to read and what supports whose arguments then you know there's no choice but to look at this stuff um, and then there's this film it's made by a guy called Ryan Dawson who uh, but I mean I'd say is borderline if not anti-semitic but um, uh, again, it's his arguments that one has to argue with, um, and it has to be said that that um, he has a strong, a lot of strong points that he makes, um, and the point being that that. Um, Being against that Netanyahu, Israeli apartheid, and the Israeli state is not to be equated with anti-Semitism. But there are people that sort of go down that rabbit hole, and then at the end of it, do then also embrace anti-Semitism. Now, I have a beef with those people. I don't like anti-Semites at all. I don't like any sort of, you know, um, any sort of racist. Uh, or yeah, hate-filled type of thing. I was just I, I, I find that really objectionable. Um, but you know, if you watch this film by Ryan Dawson, there's a lot of really interesting stuff about the propaganda of war and all the rest of it. And what he does say is that without the Holocaust narrative then World War II is just another imperial resource war and he's right about that and what we need to learn from is that World War III is another potential imperialist resource war um, and so with this film, like I say um, uh, if you haven't got the stomach for it and it's likely to upset you then don't watch it but if you are interested in knowing why it's important to 
have an idea of how the kind of manipulations which we're all supposed to be surprised that Cambridge Analytica are capable of, then you, you know, you've really got to look at one of the main narratives coming out of the Second World War and certainly since the 1970s with respect to um, a loss of faith um, and uh, sort of the kind of the moral aspects of kind of a religious belief system um, but the embracing of a different belief system surrounding the narrative of an event or a process so um, the memes and themes of holocaust denial and climate denial are unmistakable uh, and that is deeply troubling um, and to conflate, conflate the two though is hugely offensive um, you know I mean, there is no comparison between someone who denies the Holocaust and someone who denies climate change. I mean, <sighs> ethnic cleansing, mindless murder, and irrational hatred of a particular cultural group, as opposed to someone saying, No, you know, CO2 isn't causing all of that, I don't believe you, prove it. Equally speaking, though, if, if someone says, right, you know, the Holocaust, what happened, how did it happen, give me the facts, um, asking for them, I think is a perfectly valid question. And then, um, when one is in receipt of the, the provable facts, <coughs> if one then holds them up to some of the more exaggerated narratives, um, if you've cleaved to and built a belief system around the more exaggerated narrative, if you seek out that information, you're going to be surprised. Um, and uh, there's a cognitive dissonance undoubtedly will kick, kick in. Same thing with people who have fallen for... Uh, it's a separate sentence, separate paragraph. This has nothing to do with the, the Holocaust, there's nothing to fall for there. Um, there are exaggerated narratives, but with the whole climate is a completely different question and they don't believe they don't belong in the same category. Um, but the same cognitive di dissonance does apply to people who have a belief system built around the cube polar bears on ice drift and suicidal walruses uh, narrative when they are confronted with the actual science um, and it is, it is explained again there's a cognitive dissonance will uh, will kick in so um, and then tie that back to Cambridge Analytica and what they're doing and these um, psychographics suggestibility subliminal advertising etc mind manipulation mind control etc um, uh, and then factor into that virtual reality and the uh, CGI image, computer generated imaging and all the rest of it um, and uh, you know we're in a pretty interesting sort of twilight zone pretty soon right so that's Ryan Dawson then what have we got here uh, okay Joy Division this is the colonial resource war point um, And that point that Ryan Dawson makes is a very, very strong point. It's a very, very strong point indeed. Uh, then, here we are. Book burning. 
Diesen Color Sturm. So there's a thing called the Forreston Affair and a famous letter from uh, Noam Chomsky and an exchange between he and uh, George Montbiot. Um, which is worth it. This is uh, Kissinger's World Restored, uh, Metternich and Castlerath. Again, I mentioned that in my introduction. So there are the links. I'm going to like, I'm going to tweet that. That one I just want to do is to be okay. There we are, this is the it's an essay on Kissinger's book based on his doctoral thesis. So this is pre the revolutionary eighteen forty eight, so this is the period from eighteen twelve to eighteen twenty two. Um which uh that's a really interesting essay, well worth reading, even if you don't decide to read the whole book, which is the Wikipedia article here. Uh, what next have we got next? Uh, that's that one which we've done already. So, right, this is my notes to my poem Globalisation and Entangled. I'm just going to put the link in there. Then, what's this? Right, this is the anti-Semite police who I had a run-in with. Um, So this is the whole Labour anti-Semitism fuss, why the establishment want to get rid of uh, Corbyn. And I don't think it's got anything to do with anti-Semitism um, at all. Uh, I, I think it's got to do with, more to do with the military industrial complex and uh, uh, things like Trident missiles and uh, you know, the state monopoly, military industrial complex, security state, private contracting, uh, private contracting training of police forces, police state type stuff, all of which we associate with Netanyahu um, and the extreme right wing form of, uh, of uh, separatist apartheid Zionism if you like. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's um, I had this run in with these people who accused me of being an anti Semite, which you know, not, which I found quite amusing because it's simply untrue. <laughs> uh, so anyway, but I, 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 I mean, I, I actually found that actually many of them that were accusing me actually, you know, were certainly racist, and many of them also seemed to be anti Semites as well. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure actually how many of them were actually Gentiles as well. But there we are. It's, uh, it's an interesting world. Um, and of course, many of the most fervent Zionists are, in fact, evangelical Christians uh, for various reasons, um, which is something which David Icke does tackle in his book, The Biggest Secret. So, uh, yeah, you know, these, these power structures and these um, narratives, these psychological methods of, 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 of social control, economic methods, blah, 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 blah um, you know, they kind of exist and, 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 and are going to exist regardless of what motivates or creates the sort of people that have that 
kind of need for control or need for ceremony and all of these traits that tend to attach to um, you know powerful groups at the top of different elite systems and hierarchies and what have you so what well, it's um, it's very very hard to uh, deconstruct a lot of this stuff um, but discerning the general direction of flow um, you know sh should be should be possible even if we don't know what's around the next bend in the river as it were anyway uh, here we are this is the Netanyahu Zionism point uh, rhinos twats and cunts added an extra verse to the uh, Kinky Friedman song uh, they're making Jews like Jesus anymore which is hilarious Okay. Um, so there's that I was accused of tr trying to trigger Jews with that I mean I I mean Jackie Mason's one of my favourite comics absolutely makes me who I don't agree with much of his politics but he's certainly a funny bloke uh, there we go um, Formatting issues there. But, uh, there we go. Uh, that one. Uh, from little acorns, mighty oaks from little acorns grow. From back in 2011. Water. Um, there we are. Jeffrey Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida. As an ink cometh of a little spear, a spear or spire in a sapling. There we are. Uh, right. I'm going to Canterbury Tales right now. Uh, where are we? Um, Okay, we get into some of the maths and whatnot. Infinity, this is kind of free will and determinism and religious bases of some of the things we hold to be true in scientific senses, which. Uh, have other than scientific motivations. My poem, reality lives as you please, is love is infinite. Oh, it's 2013. How gravity works. By Maurice Cottrell. Again, Cottrell is quoted by uh, David Icke. with the uh, precession of the sun and the uh, orbits and the cycles etc that the Mayans uh, knew about in which Cotterell translated, deciphered and all the rest of it. This is the redshift idea which is always worth revisiting. Uh, Again, it's a long time since I was reading all of this stuff, and uh, I've got much deeper into the maths of all that since then. But, but they're, they're interesting sort of disembarkment points, if you like, in my own thing. Euler, Euler's number. This is the dyslexic artist and his theory, which uh, I must say I do like his. Um, Right, here we are. So this is Fred Hoyle, who Ike quotes. Um, and I wanted to capture that video, but I'm just going to put this in here. 
Uh, Adam Kurt is an interesting chap. Because um, Gabriel Gatehouse is kind of like the pound shop Adam Curtis in many respects. Um, but Gatehouse seems to be the fire brigade when questions arise about narratives. Whereas Adam Curtis, there's an excellent James Corbett video, sort of uh, Adam Curtis establishing contrarian, it's called. Um, and uh, Curtis's film Bitter Lake is very, very good. Um, Hypernormalization, which was the last one he made on the BBC, I didn't like as much. I mean, it's a good film, there's quite a lot in it, but, but um, I felt Bitter Lake was much better. And he made some really good um, things, like the, the Mayfair set uh, is one of his. Um, and, and he does look a lot at these questions. Um, I mean, in a way, he's kind of like a multimedia uh, Carol Quigley, the guy that wrote Tragedy and Hope, um, and brings all of that stuff up to date, because Tragedy and Hope was published in 1968. Uh, but this thing on Hoyle is interesting, it's worth watching, and um, uh, I mean, Hoyle was a fascinating bloke. So I'm going to leave that one up, because I wanted to do some more of that. This is... Uh, yeah, a reason for Euler's number within nature, or oh, Euler's number within nature. Uh, I've got my own theories on why, um, well, in fact, this guy here, if you listen to Stephen Wolfram, um, who basically says our mathematics is actually an artifact of our civilization rather than um, something that's kind of you know, discovered and pre-exists it. Uh, and I think that's true um, of Euler's number. Um, but anyway, this I did this post. Here we are. This is interesting stuff. Neural networks and duplex and Google and how that and that all works. So when I did that at the end of January. I mean, I really like that, that there's such a lot in that post. Um, and, uh, like I say, I, um, I'm going to leave that one open because that is, for my own framework, still a very important one. This is the redshift uh, thing in that previous post. Which is an article that's well worth reading. I'm going to leave that up to the propaganda multiplier. There we are, look at that. Uh, we got here. There we are, this is the uh, propaganda multiplier. Obviously, very relevant to the Cambridge Analytica and the way that information is supposed to be distributed through these news services, etc. So I'm going to leave that one up there too uh, because that is a big core of the theme here. Right, and here's Cory Morning Star, the globe's largest, most powerful behavioural change network. Avaz, okay, I mean, obviously very relevant. Uh, right, articles 2019. And besides all the Greta Thunberg stuff, there was another one yesterday about Extinction Rebellion and about um, changing minds, which is part of this theme obviously not there. Uh, right, there's my Stevie, which is on the distributed web and has a coin and blah blah blah. Um, well worth looking at. 
Right, ClearPoll. This is a polling app um, which has rewards, which is in my thing of things to study because of the polling and voting app. Um, personal destiny control, that's why that's there. This is my Twitter. Okay, let's just put the link in here, copy the link to tweets and put that there. And then we are going to find the Corrie Morning stuff. Alright, oh, that's that one there, there he is. This is uh, Sir Mark Sidwell sat in the throne. I don't want to embed it, I want to, I want to copy the link to it. Copy link to tweet. Okay, that's there. Yeah, UK Column's really been on it the last couple of weeks. And it's very, very, very good stuff. Um, but that's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is. Right, what I'm looking for. Okay, it's going to be tweets and replies, isn't it? So let's have a look. Tweets and replies. There we are, this is the one. Since rebellion training will have control radical resistance from the obstructed left and compromised you. So this is actually Cory Morningstar. Uh, and so have a look at that one. Um, okay, that's what that one was. And what have we got here? Right, okay, now. This came up on Albion Rovers um, link, and this is about another cover up of child abuse in the inquiry up in Scotland, and there's obviously one in the UK as well. Sidwell, there's an interview where he's actually answering to a committee on why the files have been lost and the Geoffrey Dickinson files and what have you. Um, and I'm gonna just uh, copy the link to that one. I'm going to put it in here, and this is the reason all that and the Fran stuff was in here earlier as well, um, and also the control file stuff, because uh, blackmail, control, coercion. Um, of all stripes down the ages it kind of has been a thing it still is a thing in the Cambridge Analytica thing clearly it's a thing you've got um, Alexander Nix clearly saying you know all oh, beautiful girls from Ukraine and all this sort of thing all oh, bring them with us blah 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 um, but you know it gets more sinister than that uh, so anyway that's there, so I'm just gonna get all of that to oh, well restored. That's Kissinger's book, uh, George Bundy. Okay, well, that's interesting because um, Henry Kissinger dedicates his book to this guy, and the Bundys are one of the power elite families in the US, although the Wikipedia article kind of understates it somewhat. Uh, Boston Brahmins, so this is the waspy elite, these are the people that the Kennedys didn't like very much, uh, and then what's this now, 
Okay, this is Groton School, which is a prep school for New Zealand. No, no. Chris Hedges went to one of these schools, whether it was Groton or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, he got a scholarship there. Um, an interesting interview where he sort of says, you know, he's obviously cleverer than a lot of these other kids. So they, they used to laugh at him, saying, well, you're much cleverer than us, but we've got it made, and you're always going to be a, a wage slave chump. Um, there we are, Groton School. Uh, what have we got here now? Episcopal Church. Right, okay. So, in terms of looking at factions in the oligarchy, the Episcopal Church, um, Bishop Curry gave the address at the Duke of Sussex wedding to Meghan Merkel uh, and it was brilliant uh, this, you know talking about love and all this sort of thing um, and so I was you know looking at Episcopalianism and, and how many presidents were actually from that thing and looking at the wealth and all the rest of it um, that's why that was there because um, you've obviously got the Catholic Church as well um, and then people also talk about the Jewish lobby in, in, in the United States but the Episcopalians seem to be way more powerful um, and uh, arguably so is the Catholic Church as a church um, but uh, You see, I think it's the it's the power and the uh, belief system between behind how that power is supposed to be exercised, um, which really drives things. Um, as I say, I don't know. I don't think I'll ever figure it out. But but it seemed to me that uh, that was worth looking at, which is why that's there. Here's Michael Curry. Like I say, I really enjoyed his sermon. I, I mean, I did watch that, and I couldn't believe my ears. It's a fantastic sermon. Um, right, and yeah, so this came out of the incomes vary among religious groups. I mean, I. I but you see, the Episcopal Church comes in at number three. I mean, I don't. I, I honestly don't think it's relevant. I really don't. Um, but things like giving alms and charity begin. You know, um, virtue in the arete sense. You know, our. our Obviously important, but um, anyway, that's that there. Um, Groton School alumni. That's what you see. I'm, uh, oh, there's one of the Bundys and stuff. And I'm not going to put these. You can find these because of uh, Skull and Bones. We're going to put in because Skull and Bones. All the Bundys were in that, and John Kerry was in that, and the Bushes were in that, and Yale, and blah blah blah. Um, so we'll leave Skull and Bones in there. Um, right, and then this guy, William Donhoff, he's brilliant. This guy, um, he wrote a book about Bohemian Grove long before Alex Jones made his film, which. Uh, um, was on the uh, television series which um, oh what's he called now staring at goats man anyway staring at goats is a, a bit, you'll find that on the blog uh, but um, Domhoff wrote a book about Bohemian Grove back in the 70s now, I, I'd never heard of this guy, but I was watching the Mark Dice 
video and I saw a book on his bookshelf and it was actually the book by this guy about Bohemian Grove but I also discovered that he does this you know who, who rules America website he's got tons and tons of uh, very interesting um, stuff but yeah anyway so William Domhoff if you want to find out about the American establishment wealth distribution and how how that all works he's your man right and then the NGO lists foundations think tanks the superclass 100 this is the ISGP portal which uh, is also hosted on wiki spooks because um, this basically just has everything on I, I want to David Icke is here look we can, we go. Um, this Institute for Cooperation in Space Global Sciences Congresses Global Sciences Conferences between 83 and 2001 um, So I think it's just a list of speakers at this place, but this place apparently is one of the foundations which falls within um, the Let's have a look. Um, all right, liberal, new left, eugenics, birth control, United Nations, anti-nuclear protesting, sustainable developer, and UFO cultism include South African think tanks there you go see there are all these groups and then there are the different people who are connected to one two or more of them um, and it's an interesting breakdown of how globally um, what's been termed the hybridized elites actually operate um, I say it, it takes quite a bit of time to go through this site um, and uh, there's a lot of very disturbing stuff about the Detroit affair in Belgium and what have you but it's uh, it's a very very interesting site which is well worth um, kind of incorporating into a long-term study program for, for ma all matters geopolitics I think uh, then we got, all right, George Robertson, okay, he's an ex-Secretary General of NATO and uh, he's in the House of Lords. I haven't looked up any of his recent speeches on Brexit or Scottish independence or anything like that. Uh, but um, suffice to say, I'm not a fan. Uh, so let's just put that in there and younger people or people with a shorter memory and all the rest of it the first time this guy rang an alarm bell for me is he was uh, Secretary of Defence in the UK and he said I'm the biggest landlord in the UK because the defence lands thing has got the most land so that makes me the biggest land he, he basically equated himself with the office and you know basically that state held property and I just it, it really jarred with me I mean my father used to work for the Defence Lands Agency before it became the PSA and all the rest of it and I don't know it was just the way he was talking it was obviously a real power trip for him and I, I, I just found it really jarring um, and then you know the, you know off he goes to NATO and all the rest of it and uh yeah, so I kind of lump him in there with uh, Sir Mark Sidwells and all the rest of it as, uh, you know, uh, these are not the sorts of people you want to be voting into office for anything, um, in my view. Um, but, you know, that's just my opinion and my intuition. I don't like the man. Uh, so, here's Anish Ran again. Uh, this is the McCann case and all of that stuff. So, um, no, 
and lots of it is half a story or a half truth there or half truth there um, but you know you stitch it all together and it sort of um, you know, it might give you you know one of the corner pieces in the top right hand part of the sky of our jigsaw puzzle as it were um, yeah Operation Condor in Europe. This is his latest one, which has got all of the Daniel Gans is an interesting chap. Gladio and all of these things playing out. Gladio two, whatever. Um, you know, we need to be thinking about this sort of stuff at the moment. Don Blaine. Uh, Robertson signed the gun certificate apparently for uh, the guy that um, did those shootings. Was this all Thomas? What's the guy called? Thomas Hamilton, that was it. Uh, so, there we are, dumb blame. Okay. David Icke made various claims as well about this sort of thing. Of course, um, John Burko's wife, uh, the Speaker of the House of Commons, got into trouble for delving into all of this stuff as well. Um, but uh, this blog changes addresses, but it is what it is. How the world is run on shame. There we go. Or truth.net. Okay, I'm going to leave that up to have a read of that later. Um, okay. I watched another film the other day. Um, called, was it called The Skin Trade or something? It's new. Maybe 2005, I think it was. It's sort of action thriller, but um, it's about all of this stuff. Okay, right, and then obviously the rabbit horn pole leads to this reptilian stuff, which which I think people believe. I mean, I, I personally am not at all. I, I'm I'm not convinced. Um, but there are parts of the, the story which, which you know that, that stand on their own and you know you don't need shape-shifting lizards and all that stuff uh, to, to get you know all sort of stuff that has happened and stuff um, but um, there is this question of sort of absurd planted things false avenues, false trails laid down um, to, to throw people off off the scent. Uh, this is like, you know, the, the word conspiracy theorist is supposed to be seeded by the CIA into public discourse following the assassination of President Kennedy. Well, of course, that happened um, and, you know, it's an open question as to who did it and why. There are several theories. Um, 
but you know, false trails. Undoubtedly, no, no. I, I mean, I just yeah, with this stuff, I, I, I really. I mean, I don't laugh at it, um, but. Um, I mean, because no one knows and no one can know. That's the thing. There are, there are some things which are just unknowable. Um, and if one suspects this and wants to make it knowable, one would have to present the proof. Uh, and I don't think anyone's done that. You know. Um, so, you know, how much proof... Everybody has a different threshold for, for how much proof they would want. But on something like this I would require some pretty solid proof. I was talking to a friend about it the other day and I said I'd expect a picture of a person in that state with, you know, that day's newspaper, you know, like these hostage videos, so you actually knew that it hadn't been doctored and happened, you know, was real evidence, you know that you could pinch yourself and it was still there sort of thing um, but uh, this is I, this guy is quoted in the real uh, in the bigger secret which is why I found this page I wouldn't have found it otherwise but if anyone's wondering um, this, this is what it's all about um, and here on this one as well, uh, this 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 book here, um, which I put myself on the to wait list to have a read of that. Um, so again, this is quoted in in that book. So that's why that's there. So I can close that now. And then we've got Fred Hoyle, who was also quoted. Um, and have, uh, actually having said, you know, um, am I a spaceman or from outer space and these different theories. Um, so that's Fred Hoyle. Okay, this is the redshift thing, theory about redshift and what have you. So, you know, lots of things to argue about. The view of cosmos. Well, I'm going to keep that for later because I haven't read that properly yet, and I wanted to have a read of it. So I'm just going to put that in there for my own notes. So if I can even close that window, and same here. The other article that I've left open further on was the one I read in 2011. So I'm just trying to sort of bring it to so. This is Fred Hoyle's son, so Jeffrey Hoyle. Okay. Yeah, I might get a couple of his books and have a read. And right, here we go. Panspermia. Okay, this is the idea that our origins are extraterrestrial. <coughs> okay, that's what that is. Then we've got nucleosynthesis. Okay, I think this is Hoyle's uh, thing here. Right, okay, and now we're going to get to um, Van Neumann's elephant. So we're going to copy the link to this tweet here. Okay, so I did that. Okay, and what do we have with this paper here, which is what this was about, which is about real numbers, data science and chaos, how to fit any data set with a single parameter, which is relevant to climate modelling. Um, it's 
not as sophisticated as all of this. Okay, so that's that. Then we come to this one here. Okay, so there, that goes there. So, this amusing little ditty, and then there's this Python code down here. Right, so for people... Uh, you see that script there? There's one where it actually moves its, its trunk, which is this this code here. Okay. So with that code, what you have to do is put it in a text editor, save it as a .py file, and then you open your... So what I did is I updated my Python and got the Python um, matplot library put in and then basically you just pointed at the this code which, which you uh, save in a text editor as a .py um, like that. Uh, and then Python will open it and it will play you the animation of the elephant wagging its trunk based on the four variables with the fifth variable wiggling the trunk uh, which um, so with four parameters I can fit an elephant and with five I can make him wiggle his trunk um, and this is to do with fitting data to scatter plots and it's a little bit like ink spot analysis or, you know, reading the clouds or reading tea leaves even. It's uh, lies, damn lies, statistics and um, uh, curve fitting, as it were. So anyway, that's, that's what that was and is. So now I've explained that, I can... Close that and close that. Um, I was quite pleased to do that because I've been getting all of my programming and development environments up to date. Uh, and with that I also installed a whole new environment which, uh, let's have a look, I want to mention this. Um, A pie charm professional, which is downloadable from the Ubuntu um, canonical library, the software library. Um, so, I need to do the secret of on my laptop too. So the there we are, license to pie charm evaluator. So, I've got the evaluator on just, just sort of having a look at that. Um, but so that updated all the different stuff apart from that um, last library which I just mentioned uh, I'm going to close that because I was going to have a look at that and I will play with it later so let's go back to where we're up to ok this guy is mentioned he's a neoliberal Mexican politician implementing various well, and this is the point about banana republic and um, what what's actually been happening in the UK in other words like this neoliberalism has been applied with steroids to the same extent as it was in South America in Chile and Mexico etc NAFTA um, we dodged a bullet, bullet on TTP and TTIP um, but uh, when will they be reopening that? When will that come back? May's withdrawal agreement. We are in CETA. 
for a number of years, you know, post the seat uh, uh, shoe into the EU, etc. So these are questions, along with military unification, which really do impact upon Brexit. Um, and uh, uh, this guy, David Icke, says he's a shape-shifting one of them or whatever. Um, so obviously doesn't accuse him of being Jewish, which tends to sort of, you know, throw that theory down the toilet. <laughs> when he's referring to these things, it's a cover for, for anti-Semitism. I mean, it's not at all, I don't think. Um, but what I found interesting about this guy is that he was this neoliberal guy and there were various electoral misdeeds and uh, questions about his appointed successor, who was like called Salinas and all this sort of thing. But it's uh, what it points to is a sort of a uh, managed democracy of the Cambridge Analytica type. So, you know, what are they saying? What are they not saying? Cambridge Analytica, were they caught offside? How many other people were offside, but the referee looked the other way, is, is really the question there. Um, so, let's just put him in here anyway, because that's a point on neoliberalism and the IMF and NAFTA and what have you. So this is more of the alien stuff, this guy Phil Schneider um, and the Denver airport. So this is, um, you'll find things like the Georgia Standing Stones and you'll find things like, um, what's it called? or something that uh, the oil thing in, in, in Kyrgyzstan or Kazakhstan or whatever the um, Asana there are various theories about um, these super cities which will become headquarters for different ruling territories um, and it's mooted this the, the big city they're talking about building in Saudi up near the Red Sea. Um, they're all fancies to fit in with this kind of control grid, all these you know central points, new central points of power, and what have you. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, and again, there are distractions all the way along this this uh, this little sort of rabbit hole or, or, or complex of rabbit holes and um, they, they, it's just not necessary you don't need all of this stuff to, to actually get an idea of you know who's doing what to who um, and who seems to be on whose side and who may be playing both sides against the middle and all of this sort of thing this is Morris Cottrell's website and his theory of gravity and his other books there. I like Morris Cotterell, an interesting chap. Uh, there we are, this is paper on causal global warming, which he puts down to um, the Earth's core and stuff like that. I'll leave that in just for reference. I'm going to leave that open and have another read of it later. Graft in politics, okay. And this is we're getting there now. This is the bribery and corruption. So it's bribery, corruption, and coercion, really. So graft. Right now, Nazi propaganda and this guy Stryker. Now this is interesting in terms of publishing and who this guy was and. Um, you know, the rise and fall, as it were. Um, so we're going to leave him in. 
because it's in terms of web 3 and uh, its ability to you know give a a message that people the truth seekers can trust if you like as opposed to the sort of psychographic managed interme uh, in intermediated um, stuff that you get from mainstream media or from Google algorithms and possibly through uh, in that video platform I was telling you about where they actually moderate if you like moderation and intermediation basically um, but uh, this guy he was basically a terrorist this guy was basically Rupert Murdoch um, in a brown shirt uh, so um, but studying the newspaper industry and this sort of thing is informative you know, and that was their internet one of these um, where they put the newspapers and people could read it on the street and it, you know, it was a horrible newspaper and all the rest of it but um, nonetheless part of journalistic history um, so this is Thoughtco um, which is a new website I haven't seen before which is kind of like um, little sort of um, articles and things about you know people who want to get snack size bits of information about stuff um, and uh, there's stuff about American politics and all the rest of it so the Greenback Party and what have you so I'm just gonna dump these things into here because I'm how they fit into a wider context of um, psychographics, propaganda, uh, consensus-based governance, disintermediation on blockchains and all the rest of it, uh, socio-political control structures, power control structures, etc. Yeah, so I wanted to find out about the Whig Party in the um, USA and what have you, which is why that's there. Um, I think James Delingpole calls himself a Whig. Um, that's quite an interesting choice. Andrew Jackson, President Trump had a picture of Jackson in his office. So the sorts of things that he stood for. Uh, so Polk and Harrison sort of come into play here. I like this cartoon here, uh, she's addicted to the spoils, so the spoils system, which is uh, related to pork barrel politics and um, graft and all the rest of it. So the Know Nothing Party is very interesting, a nativist American party that really didn't like the Catholics. Um, and they were around in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, whatever. So that's an interesting piece of history, interesting period. Um, and people keep fancying that we're sort of in the period in the run-up to the First World War, when, when they're sort of looking for analogues, if you like. Um, well, you pays your money and takes your choice, really. Then mythology and religion. I'd say it's an interesting website, this. I, um, and these are, you know, a bunch of things which I've just wanted to revisit when I get the time. Uh, and a lot of this stuff coincides with themes in the Conquest of Doe novel. Um, and from reading The Biggest Secret and all the rest of it, I've come to a realisation that um, there are a few 
unturned pages which I must get my head around um, so that I can build some sort of uh, consistency into my own, or internal consistency at any rate, within my own, uh, or to my own satisfaction. Um, Lazy gods and goddesses. Let's see. Who's getting there? These little summaries of the Greek classical pages are really quite handy little ditties, as it were. I shall put them in my notes. Oh, no. It's always an interesting one, the equivalent Roman and Greek gods. That's as far as certainly we ever got in my school days we certainly didn't go into the Sumerian side of things seven against thieves I, that struck me as interesting with the magnificent seven and the uh, breakaway party but, um, In terms of election meddling back then, um, yeah, it's, um, nothing new under the sun, as they say. So here we go. Right, Russian interference in the 2016 Brexit referendum. So that was a theme that was coming up and did come up in a summary. So, Nimrod, Nibiru, and Anunnaki. Alright, so I downloaded. No, I'm just going to keep that there. Hollywood Babylon. Okay, so this was. Uh, uh, Archetypes and myths. Michel Foucault, I've got that, is not a situation. This is supposed to be a post structuralist or post modernist, and he's uh, rejected those people. But I like his notion of the episteme, which is the not only what is the knowable, but what is the allowable, which is very interesting. Structuralism. Structuralism in there. Situationism, so this is your Guy Debord stuff. So, this is your libertarian Marxist and anarchist stuff. Um, it's an interesting poster, but I'm going to leave that one up. And then, what have we got here? Right, so this is. Evolution of everyday life. Okay, so that's something to read. It's the latest. I'll leave that one open. Ah, Joseph Salmon was a ranter. So this is Joseph Salmon, the ranter. And there's a poem of his quoted at the beginning of that uh, book there. Ah, right, okay, well I think I've got pretty much as far as I need to get with that. And the situationists, and it's a different way of making information available in a disintermediated format. And psychographics is a way of mediating a message to tailor a suggested response and playing on suggestibility and personality archetypes is really what the what the point is and there's nothing new in that um, and hey here's the big surprise they're not the only person that know about it or even have been doing it um, and were they even caught is, is, is 
really the, the question. So, right, okay, we'll pick the bones out of that. 